Hey, hello everybody. Welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing well and that you're all having a fantastic day. As always, a free way to support the channel is by leaving a like, by leaving a comment, by leaving two comments, or by subscribing. If you have not already done so, I hope that everyone out there is having a great holiday season. Hope you all have some time off, hopefully, to relax. And without further ado, welcome back to another news I missed. Where I go over news I missed. Yeah, <laughs> let's jump into it. According to Microsoft's director, the Ethereum network could gain even more adoption in the future. The network's offerings and capabilities will make it the ground zero for apps in 2023. York Rhodes, the director of digital transformation at Microsoft, has hailed Ethereum's stellar features and has predicted that the network will be the go-to hub for apps by 2023. Okay. As the world exonerably marches towards a decentralized future, dApps, or decentralized applications, are beginning to rise in popularity, and according to dApps Radar, there are over 9,000 decentralized applications in existence. We've spoken about this before, not as much. I think the conversation is beginning to rise once again, the idea being many years ago when Ethereum was first proposed, released, told to the public, the idea was that Ethereum would be a world computer. I know that even seems completely abstract and kind of weird to even say out loud and or to think about, but once again, think about the internet, now think about a second internet that is decentralized. You can do whatever you want on top of it, but it is also Ethereum at the exact same time. It says, prediction, Ethereum becomes the decentralized app store by 2023, said Rhodes against the backdrop of falling revenues from traditional app stores like Google and Apple. Rhodes' prediction of 2023 might be tied to the Ethereum network's transition from proof of work to proof of stake that will usher in a new era for the network. The transition is viewed as a major solution to the nagging problem of scalability. <laughs> I think it's a little bit more than that. Scalability and super high gas fees associated with Ethereum in the last couple of years. Already, Ethereum's co-founder Vitalik Buterin has proposed some short-term scaling solutions for the network. Quite fascinating. I don't think it's a, a random act of kindness or haphazard that it happens to be a, a member of... Uh, Microsoft. I mentioned this other times before. If you ha have never seen this, uh, it's called the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. They've been around for quite a long amount of time, and one of their active uh, founding, uh, often using them members, actually is Microsoft. So, yeah, just always, once again, always dig a little bit further than you think that you have to, and you'll find a lot about uh, why people say certain things or why they are thinking that certain applications are going to be the best thing in the entire world. Um, I still do think that Ethereum has a very bright future. I think it simply needs to upgrade now. You know, four years is a little bit of a, a very long time. I feel like th there's something also happening behind the scenes because there's been a lot more Ethereum support this year than there has been before. You know, we've always had people who are into Ethereum, but this year for some reason, there was a lot of talk and discussion about Ethereum, not only flipping Bitcoin, cool, got it, amazing, but also like the amount of uh, work and attention that would be paid to it and how much is going to be built on top of it and exactly what the future is going to be when it comes to decentralization and passive income and all these other things is coin burn, yab, 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 yab. Anyway, cool. Let's see if it happens. We have no choice but to see if this eventually takes place. I would find it quite, I mean, by all means, in all counts, it should happen. It's just a matter of them actually finally upgrading. Yeah. Let's move on. Also, for some reason in the news, the US SEC has rejected two more physically backed Bitcoin ETFs proposed by Valkyrie and Cryptoin, respectively. Both decisions can be found here and here. I have one of them open so you can actually see it, uh, which came on Wednesday with the SEC providing the same argument it used in the past when it rejected other applications. According to the commission, the New York Stock Exchange ARCA and the CBOE BZX Exchange, which filed respective proposed rule change Two trade Valkyrie and crypto Cryptoin products failed to demonstrate, they said, failed to demonstrate that their proposals are consistent with the requirements of the Exchange Act Section 6B-5. So uh, you may have noticed over the last couple of days-ish, give or take, uh, that the prices have been swaying sideways. We tried to hit 50000 a couple of times, bah, 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 you kind of get the point. Um, 
I think a portion of it could have been because of this. As much as I would like to believe and like to be in a market that actually makes sense, uh, every other time before, it's been about 45 times now over the last seven or uh, four or five years uh, that this has happened. Every single time that the SEC rejects a Bitcoin ETF, prices tend to slump a tiny bit. Not exactly sure why, but alas, here we are. So uh, no one should be surprised. They rejected every single Bitcoin ETF that there has actually been it, it kind of ties into something that we will talk about a bit later on in this video as well. But once again, I told you not to hold your breath. I, I think it's completely pointless. Uh, I think that the SEC knows exactly what they're doing. If there was something now, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, they basically state continuously over and over that said company has not done what they should have done or had proposed in their paperwork that would have allowed the SEC to accept them as opposed to the SEC just telling them what they need to do. And then the company does it so that there's no confusion afterwards. But, you know, uh, regulators going to manipulate. Anyway, that's the SEC news. And without further ado, let's move on. Next up, also, I'm sure you're seeing a pattern here. Recently, Jurian Timmer, director of global macro at Fidelity Investments, compared the network growth of Bitcoin and that of Ethereum. Here's the actual thing right here. He said, we tend to look at price, but for me, valuation is more relevant. Here we see Bitcoin's price to network ratio. Bitcoin's fundamentals explains a lot of this meteoric price gains. Metcalf's law at work. It's not just about stock to flow. Although both networks are growing steadily, Timmer says that Ethereum is growing faster. He also points out that Ethereum's valuation as defined by market cap network ratio is lower than that of Bitcoin because investors seem to be seduced by Bitcoin's superior scarcity dynamics, so he says. I, I think a lot of it really comes down to uh, what people care about for the long term. I think a lot of people really do believe that Bitcoin is going to be around for a very long time, at least until the year 2140, when the last piece of Bitcoin is actually mined. I think the the narrative behind the insanely wealthy people who are backing Bitcoin have gotten into Bitcoin and all the integration of Bitcoin into traditional products, I think also is a driving factor as well. And then on the other side, you have people who believe that Bitcoin is slow. Ethereum is faster. Ethereum is going to upgrade. Ethereum is going to have this. Ethereum is going to do that. Ethereum is going to be the, the, the dApp store of the future. You have all these narratives. And once again, no one knows what's going to happen. I've been in the market long enough that I've heard so many proposals, not only for uh, Bitcoin, but also for Ethereum. And like three of them have actually come true. It takes a very long time to upgrade anything on, on Bitcoin. And it's the same exact thing for Ethereum. You can make other layers and other things like that, sure. But it's a matter of people actually using them. The, the future is going to be quite fascinating because I do think that we are moving into a completely digital world atmosphere. NFTs, ABCs, you kind of completely name it. Um, but the idea of Ethereum actually becoming what it's setting out to be. And if it does now, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. If Ethereum in every single way is actually able to do what they've been saying that they wanted to do since 2015, 2016, bit, then Ethereum is clearly going to be the winner and no one else will be able to stand up to it. But if it continues taking a very long time, and once again, everything that's wrapped around Ethereum simply gets wrapped around Bitcoin, well, you know, that's how things go. Anyway, that's the Ethereum is looking better than Bitcoin news because that just seems to be the trend this week. And yeah, let's move on. Also in the news, the Senate of Paraguay has passed a bill on Thursday that aims to regulate cryptocurrency mining and trading within the country. On Thursday, the Senate of Paraguay enacted a law aimed at regulating Bitcoin and cryptocurrency trading and mining within the country. Senator Fernando Silva Facetti, the bill co-author, said on Twitter that the bill will now be debated in Paraguay's Chamber of Deputies in 2022. Why it has to be ba bast, passed and then debated, I'm not really sure, but that's just how the world works. In Paraguay, the bill does not make Bitcoin legal tender. Did the bill, did the bill say that? Did someone assume that, the, that Paraguay was going to make Bitcoin legal? Why is that sentence here? During a conversation with Paraguayan Congressman Carlitos Rejala, in July, an executive peak at the draft bill was released. The bill hinted at a stronger regulatory oversight from the country's regular 
regulators, regulators when it comes to Bitcoin mining, as well as an overarching purpose of providing investor safeguards from enterprises that offer Bitcoin services. Where is anything about the legal tender? Why was that sentence thrown in there? Anyway, so yeah, uh, it has passed the Senate and now is going to be voted on by the chamber sometime in 2022. No exact time frame. Awesome for them. I think that's wonderful. I think any time that we hear that a country is going to be Listen, I'd rather have regulation over a complete ban if you kind of catch my drift. Um, I assume that cryptocurrencies in many different countries have become so large that governments like feel obligated in some sort of way to finally regulate the things that they cannot regulate. And it always just ends up coming down to taxes and telling us where your money is going, even though that second part is a little bit more difficult with a lot of these networks. So cool. Wonderful. I hope they get their laws and without further ado, let's move on. Next up, Manasquan, 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 Manasquan. I like Manasquan. It, it sounds like a Final Fantasy game. Manasquan Bank, a mutual community bank in New Jersey, servicing residents since 18, geez, 1874, wow, has announced it is partnering with the company Backed, that is B-A-K-K-T, to give its retail clients the ability to hold, sell, and buy crypto through the bank's mobile banking application. A mutual community bank headquartered in Wall Township. Uh, wow, okay. New Jersey will give bank customers the ability to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrencies. Manasquan Bank. Manasquan? Uh -huh. Bank announced this decision on Tuesday in a press release published by Back to Themselves. The New Jersey Bank offers personal and business banking services and operates 15 separate branches in those places. So cool. Um, well, okay, Br bringing it back. This is another bank who has entered the cryptocurrency space. That's wonderful. They've partnered with Bact, which is basically the New York Stock Exchange to be able to do, is, do this. So I wonder what the actual connection between them is. Um, I like that they use the word retail clients, basically meaning normal everyday people. It's usually, once again, always retail or institution, which is how usually uh, bankers lump people. You're either super rich or you're basic. Not even joking. That's basically how the actual metric is. So the fact that they're going to be allowing or advertising for normal clients to be able to get into cryptocurrency is fantastic. It's exactly what I want. I'm tired of cryptocurrency just being for the ultra wealthy. They already have money. Everyone else needs money. You know what I'm saying. So anyway, yeah. Um, uh, ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. The program will begin in the second quarter of 2022 and is still contingent on the adoption by the bank's core financial service. Uh, they, they don't have a choice. These It's, it's, it's not like they're going to have an actual discussion like if they should or should not do something. If you don't do this, you're going to be left behind. There's no actual like, oh, like coin flip. Oh, well, let's, let's just not adopt a brand new thing that everyone else in the world is actually doing. So, you know. Anyway, very cool. I think this is the actual press release right here. Yep, there we go. It says, Manasquan Bank selects... Ba I know I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, but Manas... Quan sounds cooler. Bank selects backed to offer retail clients access to crypto currency. Fantasticals. And without further ado, let's move on. Next up, also in the news, the Japanese financial giant and crypto heavyweight SBI Holdings, who was in the news a lot in 2017, has unveiled the nation's first crypto fund for individual retail investors. But yeah, <laughs> although they will need to have very deep pockets if they want to take part, I'm not sure why they did this, but it's sure, why not? As well as its executive securities and banking operations, SBI operates or part owns a number of crypto exchanges as well as a crypto mining arm as well. It is one of Ripple's closest affiliates. I think the, the head of SBI is one of their board members, one of Ripple's board members, so they're a little close if you catch my drift. And after another bullish year for the company in crypto, SBI has some has come good on a promise to unleash a Japan Japan why, why, why can't I read? A Japan-based crypto fund before the end of this year. Um however, if you want to join in, you need $44,100 to join the fund. Uh, apparently, it is going to be, uh, the fund will be made up of um, XRP, Bitcoin, and Ethereum, 
this four more tokens, they haven't said what they're going to be. I just assume, I don't know, Cardano? No, 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 no. I'm not going to even say any other coins because I'm almost certain that the other four coins, are pro two of them will probably be um, like corporation coins, which is usually always ends up happening. But cool question mark. Um, I think it's really weird that you would offer this to retail people or uh, people who aren't institutional investors and expect them to simply have $44,000 laying around to be able to dump into multiple different coins. Doesn't make a lot of sense. I think this would have been great if you needed like a minimum of $100, even $50, or had some type of like a thing where they were like, hey, we have this new fund. It's going to give you allocations to cryptocurrency. Every month, you can throw in $50 into it, $100 into it. That, you know, that really builds things up a lot quicker than this. But I assume they have their own method to their madness. But I don't know exactly uh, what it is. So cool. SBI is... I didn't even know they had promised this to people. SBI is launching a, a Bitcoin altcoin fund uh, for still rich people. Because, uh, you know, the average person, remember we were talking about that before? There was like a, was two, three years ago, there was like an article that came out and they were asking people, if, if, if there was an emergency right now, would you be able to find $300 like for that emergency? And I like at 70% said no. And then I sat there with my friends and I was like, imagine if that was like $3,000 emergency and people still said no. So I'm going to just not you know, assume uh, that a lot of people don't have $44,100 lying around to be able to throw into anything. Anyway, that's the SBI coin uh, fund news. Here's the actual article for it right here. I don't read Japanese, but I'm going to assume this is it as this was the actual one that was linked to it. Yeah, let's move on. And to finish things off, don't even have to really read through this one. It says Grayscale's Bitcoin trust hits a record discount of 21.3%. Many moons ago, now there seems to be a very logical reason for this. Uh, Grayscale's Bitcoin trust or Bitcoin fund was basically, wink, a, uh, a Bitcoin ETF, if you will. It was the closest thing that people within the United States had to anything Bitcoin ETF-esque. A couple of months ago, um, Grayscale also applied to the SEC to convert their trust into an actual Bitcoin ETF and exchange traded fund, and they were given the no by the US SEC. However, around that same exact time, we had about 14, not a, a fake number, uh, 14 other uh, Bitcoin ETFs or exchange traded notes or exchange traded funds uh, products as well launching around the world. We even had news that a lot of other companies uh, simply were bought, especially Fidelity was the largest one with like trillions of dollars, uh, moved their money to Canada to actually get that Bitcoin ETF that they couldn't have access to in America. So I would assume that Grayscale's Bitcoin Trust has lowered its discount simply because people have moved any money that they did have in Bitcoin's Grayscale's Bitcoin Trust into other countries that actually have ETFs that they were trying to invest into. You get it? This was a pseudo ETF. It wasn't really an ETF. And now that we actually have other Bitcoin ETFs around the world, except for the United States, it seems people are simply just moving their money out of it. So yeah, um, usually this was a, a very large indicator of exactly where Bitcoin's price was going to go a couple of months ago uh, when Grayscale had a very high premium, not a discount, very high premium. The price was moving up uh, simply because this was the only place people could actually alternatively institutionally invest in Bitcoin. And now that that's no longer the case, that's why they have a discount. Yeah, see, not too difficult. Just kind of, you know, logic if you want to throw logic at it. Anyway, yes, um, I do hope that you've all enjoyed. I, I, I sincerely do hope that you're all having a really great time wherever you are. Uh, I hope nothing stressful. Try and relax yourself. Go take a bath. Watch a funny movie. I plan on watching, I think, just about every single uh, Christmas movie that I can. I find them enjoyable. Don't know why. Um, I do hope you all enjoyed. I do hope that you all are having a great day, a great morning, a great afternoon, a great evening, a great holiday, wherever you are, wherever you might be. I do hope that it is absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching and or listening. And I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.